Yeah, you're very welcome back to Off The Ball Saturday here on Newstalk. Shane Hanna with you through until 5pm this evening or so. And we're going to do something slightly a bit different. Uh, it's a panel that uh, came to us and the idea came to us uh, and it's with the Department of Justice. Sharing intimate images without consent is a crime. Visit hotline.ie to report quickly, easily and anonymously or can't contact on Garda Shia Khanna. Of course, our audience being a young male predominantly audience. We thought this was a, a perfect platform in which to, to bring light to this subject and highlight it as well. Delighted to have on the line Lee Nickel, the former professional footballer, most recently with Crystal Palace. She's going to share her story with us very shortly. And also in studio, we have Katrina Bentley, the CEO of Men's Aid Ireland, and on Gordish Econa, Detective Superintendent Ian Lackey as well. Ian and Katrina, very welcome. Thanks for coming to the studio. You. Thank you. Uh, and Lee, thanks for joining us on the line as well. Thank you for having me. Brilliant. Pleasure to have you all you guys. Uh, with us this afternoon. Very uh, important topic, I think it's fair to say, Ian, this one. Um, and one that comes to our attention when we see the t TV ads and the commercials highlighting this and highlighting the fact that sextortion and the, the sharing of graphic images without consent online is is a crime. Um, maybe define for us sextortion and revenge porn and, and these things because we're used to hearing these terms, but maybe not everyone is familiar with what they mean. Yeah, well, I suppose the legislation is the Harassment, Harmful Communications and Related Offences Act. That only commenced back in February of 2021. And that came into being after uh, Nicole Coco Fox. It's also known as Coco's Law, took her own life after suffering bullying and a campaign driven by her mother, Jackie, to change the laws around online harm. There's two distinct elements to it. One is where people are being blackmailed or money is attempted to be extorted from them over an image that may exist. And the, the other one might also follow maybe the breakup of a relationship where mm -hmm. there's a revenge element in it, um, that if you don't continue to go out with me, I will do X, Y or Z. So they're the two distinct uh, things. What we have seen is it's generally uh, men that money is, they look to extort money from, and it, more women uh, would report the other aspect of it to us. So. Um, there's been a significant increase in the number of reporting of reports to us, which we see as a positive. Yes. Um, so in the last, uh, we're now December, in the last 10 months, we have had a, a twofold increase in the number of uh, incidents reported to us. And now that prosecutions are being directed, uh, because there's obviously a lag factor, um, we have seen a threefold increase in the number of prosecutions. So more people are coming forward to report it. Which, which is a positive. Uh, and we've run a number of campaigns in the past and we see this as, you know, a positive. And Katrina, this, this mm -hmm. is something that you, you guys would see, I'm sure, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, all too regularly in, in Men's Aid Ireland. And uh, as Ian says, uh, like, and even with the, the rise of phones and social media in the last 10, 20 years, this is obviously going to become something that's more and more of a problem. Mm -hmm. um, is it something you, you see quite often? It is indeed. Um, I suppose um, so it's, uh, the activity of, of social media, things are changing, dating is changing um, and, and how people are using their phones are changing. Um, and I suppose in particular, um, the research and the data that ourselves, I'm on Garda Shia Khan and the Department of Justice, ha Justice uh, has acquired is that 18 to 23 year old person whereby um, I suppose initially what was taken as a, as, as a fun photograph, etc. They don't realise that, you know, down the line it could be used in a more harmful and, and, and in a more harmful way. Um, so in men's aid, we're working with men from the ages of 18 to 90 plus. Okay. So um, the examples that we have had in relation to calls to our helpline, um, firstly, I suppose an example would be a young guy, 20, 21, 22 in college, um, was it started a new relationship with a girl that he met. They were only dating for six months. He was trying to cool it, trying to end the relationship. And she turned around and said, if you break it off with me, I'm going to share that image. Um, thankfully, he did speak to his mum and dad then, who then also got in touch, touch with ourselves. And then we uh, we linked them in with Angar the Shia Kona to, to, to carry that forward. Um, and the other example as well is for people who are in same-sex relationships. So another gentleman who was in touch with us um, and the relationship had finished um, and it didn't finish well. And it was a couple of months later that his ex uh, threatened to out him and shared the image and out into his family because he hadn't actually come out to his own family right. that he was a, a gay gentleman. So, um, and I suppose what we're hearing is is that the 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 emotional and the psychological, the impact, um, the anxiety, the depression, not sleeping, and um, for some of the guys, not turning up at college, no longer going to training, mm -hmm. not going to their sports skill, not going to to, to to their training, their usual um, their usual kind of routine. 
um, and starting to isolate and, 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 and living basically in a state of fear because somebody has purely threatened. So I think what's terrific about this legislation, and it's still in the early days, is that even the threat to share mm -hmm. is enough for Angarda mm -hmm. Shia Kona right. to, to start the, the, criminal, um, uh, the criminal process. So not just the act. The not the threat. act. So really what the Guard the Year are trying to do here is catch it in the tracks before mm -hmm. it happens, the prevention side, which actually that threat is the key, key piece, which is really terrific. Um, as I said at the outset, like it's something that we don't talk about too often on a, on a sports show, but we we should, given our the nature of our audience, and even I'm looking at a couple of examples in the world of sport that came up in the last couple of years. A couple of years ago, uh, Karim Benzema, the France and, and Real Madrid striker, uh, was found guilty of conspiring to blackmail a fellow French footballer with a sex tape. You had uh, Deli Ali as well uh, had a sex tape leaked uh, reportedly back in May of 2018. Um, so this does happen, and and Lee if, Lee Nicol, if I could just bring you in as well, because your your story is. Uh, is harrowing, but it's also inspiring uh, what you've done thereafter and raising awareness as to what happened to yourself. Maybe for people unfamiliarly, tell us a little bit about your story and, and what exactly happened to you. Yeah, so um, a little bit different to this extortion scam and it's happening more and more um, at the moment, but I was the victim of revenge porn. Um, something that's not as common um, is... When I had, I had sex tapes with an ex-partner when I was 18 um, and five years on from that when I was 23 is when I actually found out that these videos had been posted online. So I was really young when those videos were taken and obviously in hindsight, um, a lot of lessons have been, been learned by myself. But it wasn't my partner. It wasn't anyone that I knew that, that hacked into my device, my iCloud. It was an unknown source. Um, and we predict this to be one of these scammers, um, whether they were in the UK or another country, that's something that we, we haven't been able to find out. So usually in cases like mine, it's someone that you know that, that does this to cause you harm. And with the, the name Revenge Porn, that that does suggest that someone's out there to, to cause you harm or, or get revenge over you. So it was a little bit different to obviously um, what most people do suffer with. Um, but I had numerous videos and, and pictures um, leaked online and that was uh, the toughest moment of my life and perhaps probably the tough thing, toughest thing that I ever will go through. And the moment that I found that out, um, I stopped everything. I stopped playing football, very similar to, to what's just been spoke about. Didn't want to uh, go out my house, didn't want to go to the shops, didn't want to go out with my friends, didn't want to go to work. Um, so I took myself away and I isolated myself. Um, I lost my football career because of it. And life became really tough. I think within three days I was I was trending on Pornhub, um, which is just that as a young girl, you never grow up thinking that you end up on a site like that. And I learned so much about the porn industry itself and how these things go. Uh, go. Um, I think before it happened to me, I assumed that every single part of um, intimate images or videos that are out there for the public to see. Um, I thought they were all consensual um, and I probably, I was very ignorant towards it and I just assumed that cele celebrities or people put the videos out there themselves, just like what every other person would probably be thinking listening to this. But I didn't realise just how much people um, were going through what I was going through um, and to end up on the world's biggest porn site, I think it was... I don't know how people survive it. I still don't know how I got through it. I think there's many different things that, that got me through it, but I had those moments where I didn't want to be here. I didn't see a way out. I didn't think it would ever get better. I didn't think it would ever go away. And people judge you. People have their own say um, on you. That's people around you. That's strangers. That's people that you'll never meet. That And that's worldwide. And I think the toughest thing in all of it was having to speak to my own family because they went through it as well. It wasn't just me struggling. It was my family and friends that struggled. Um, they went through it just as much as I did, um, probably a little bit more than I did because they were so worried about me. Um, but having your iCloud leaked, I learned key, key lessons. Like that iCloud that I, I had was an email address linked to when I was 12, 13 years old when I first started up. I don't know if it was a, a Facebook or a Bebo account. Um, I had never changed my email address. So naturally, I was very lazy as well and I had always had the same password. So you're then at higher risk of these things happening. I also didn't have two-factor authentication on, on my iCloud or any of my apps that I had, which gives you that extra layer of security. But 
through it all, I lost something I'll never get back again. And that is my privacy. Um, no matter what I do the rest of my life, like I've lost that privacy. It's not as if um, your body parts change if you get older. They remain the same. And now I know that, that a lot of people um, in the world have seen something that I wish they didn't and I'll never get back. There seems to be a lot of ignorance around the topic as well, Lee, in terms of people don't realise the damage that, that's caused. They should realise the damage that's caused, but maybe don't. Um, I, I, and I've read you a quote from yourself, Lee, before where you said, the damage is done for me, so this is about the next generation. And you spoke about how yeah. prevention is better than someone having to react to this, which is what uh, Ian and Katrina, Katrina are talking about here in studio. Like, prevention is so much better than reaction. Yeah, no, absolutely like this it isn't about me anymore when I share my story I still get I personally get so much more abuse every single time that I speak about it publicly and sometimes I get bored of my own voice because I'm like people just are going to think that I'm annoying now but it isn't about me it's about my niece and nephews that I'm strongly connected to that are 10 years old and 12 years old and I am so scared for the future for them. And I'm scared that this ever happens to them because it is becoming more and more common. So once the act is done, it's done. It is, it, it, to me, I'm like, justice is justice. But as an individual that's gone through that and had private images or videos leaked and trending online, you can't, you can't ever make that better. You just have to deal with the scars and the wounds that you've got from that. So to hear that the threat of these things is going to be treated as seriously as the act of it, that is everything to me because it's all about the threat. If we can deal with it before it happens and people can be held account accountable for, for the threat, that, that's where it that's where it needs to be stopped. It can't once the act is done, that means the damage is done. And I know that then after months and, and years of, of campaigning and trying to fight individuals that have caused an individual that kind of pain, that justice can be done, but you'll never get that back. The, the most important part in that is your privacy. So I think we do need to stop it at source, and that is starting at the threat level. Um, that needs to be taken just as seriously as the act, because as soon as the act happens, you're then dealing with trying to keep people alive, trying to encourage people that it's going to be OK and to take that step out the front door and that one day it will get better, but that's really, really hard for an individual that's going through it to see. There's no light at the end of the tunnel in the, in the first few months of going through this. Katrina, the, the, the impact of, you hear from Lee's, Lee's story there, which is harrowing, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Like, and you'd have seen the impact of, of victims, both like there's male and female exactly, victims absolutely. of this, of course. Mm -hmm. and yeah. What sort of impact do you see on victims? Because I guess this, mm -hmm. the, the crux of this piece we're doing today is not just to raise awareness that it's an illegal act mm -hmm. uh, to even threaten something like this but but to highlight the the impact it can have on, on a victim likely mm -hmm. as well but you'll have seen that yourself absolutely um firstly just to, to say well done and to thank Leah for being so courageous and in, in being so public because this conversation is going to stop others in their tracks from mm -hmm. from, from from doing what what the, the living nightmare and the traumatic impact on on Leah um so yes I suppose what we're hearing and what we see is is exactly what she's just described there in terms of the, w w when you're in the fog of it and you're under that threat, the impact on your every part of your life, your 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 home life, your your sport life, what you're doing in the workplace, um, every aspect of your life is actually literally under attack as such. So the emotional and psychological impact is is it's actually indescribable, really. Mm -hmm. um, so again, to the the importance of tackling it as a prevention and um, before and the threat side of it is is what is what is key. Um, but also what to look out for as well if if so, if you think someone's you know behaviors are changing so if you're hearing from from a friend that there's anxiety stress depression if they're not sleeping well um, if they suddenly start skipping you know um, their sports training if they start skipping you know college if they start to you know ringing in sick etc to actually to be aware is something going on is there something underlining because someone is changing their behaviors as well mm. to to reach out to that person um, and and to see see what, what what's going on for them because it the, probably the most difficult conversation as Lee just said is actually to sit down in the kitchen and yeah. tell your mum or your dad yeah. or your partner or a brother or a sister that there is an image of you it's a personal image it's an intimate image and there is a threat to your privacy and the impact on the wider family so um, it, it it is happening we know it is we know it's widespread we're hearing it on our helplines we're hearing it in our in our outreach um, clinics as well um, and just really to act on it as quickly as possible um, and to involve members of on, on guard the Shia 
I'm, I'm looking here, Ian, at just some of the, the, the stats even around this as well. According to hotline.ie, this is the Irish National Centre responsible for, for combating illegal content online. They received 688 reports in relation to intimate image abuse in, in 2022. 688 reports in one year. So there's been a 93% successful removal rate by hotline.ie and the removal of intimate images takes an average of zero to three days. But as Katrina says, I guess the whole point of this is to remove that embarrassment and, and shame aspect to, to this. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think for, it, it's timely that you mention Hotline because if people are too embarrassed or too ashamed about this, I would ask them as the first instance to talk to Hotline. They don't need to ultimately involve the guards Hotline will only involve us if it's a person under 18 years of age okay. where there's an obligation on them to do so. So they, they will tell people about how they can contact the guards, but it doesn't mean the guards will get involved. So that's an important point, to, I think, to make. Um, hot, uh, as you say there, Hotline, they are extremely successful at getting images removed, which is which is the main thing, that people just want this, to, this not to happen. Mm. Um, but we have a very good relationship with Hotline. Um, I don't have the up-to-date figures, but I think this year they will be very much up on yeah. uh, last year. But I think that's, again, more people are aware of the service and will make contact with them and are getting it removed, which is a positive thing as well. Uh, Lee, like, did you have, from, from, from your club at the time, I know you, you, were, you were with Crystal Palace, you were also with Charlton before that as well, Like, were there supports there for you when you needed them? Because I'm sure the mental anguish that surrounded all of this at the time was was horrendous. But did you have those supports? Uh, it's really difficult. I, I did have full support of the club in terms of their emotional support and, and non-judgment and financial support when it came to trying to fight the, the national newspapers from printing it. But I wouldn't say there was necessarily any of that. There was no therapy, there was no counselling, there was, there was no one understood what I was about to go through rather than just going through at that precise moment. Um, so I, I will only speak so highly of Charlton that I was at at the time, but there was no professional support on on that because I think at that time it was a upcoming crime that hadn't really touched many sports people. There has been obviously some cases of it, but no one knew how to deal with that. Everyone learned in that football club from what happened to me um, right from the top down. But one thing I would, look, looking back, say is everyone is much more equipped now to deal with a situation like that but it's it's really sad that it's took it to happen to someone at their football club to to maybe know what's what's available then because we were learning about um over here like the revenge porn helpline i was speaking to samaritans and i was trying to get as much free support as possible because as a as a female athlete or if you're not a professional athlete that's at the top of your game you don't earn much money so to try and pay for media lawyers to try and get it down from online that's, that's that was also a huge stress that I had. So the club were fantastic, but there wasn't any of that signposting um, available. But I now know that that's something that is now in place, which I'm really, really grateful for. But at the time, I, I didn't have much. Um, I had me and my amazing friends and family trying to find as much help as possible that was out there on this. But... Um, I was just Googling revenge porn, mm. like, and seeing what came up on Google to be like, is there any victims of this? Has this happened before? Um, I very much so learned every minute of every day on my own personal experience, and so did those around me. And how are you now with it, Lee? Because I know at the time you, you, you've spoken before very honestly um, about, you know, losing weight and stopping eating and drinking and, 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 and all of that. Um, like, uh, how are you now with the whole thing? I mean, I've put weight back on probably a bit too much, so I think that's a good sign. But um, no, I am. I have a lot more good moments than I do bad now. Um, now, I am not healed completely. I think I will never will heal completely from it. I have majority of my life really good, but sometimes it gets to me. There's, there's times where if I'm maybe on a night out and someone makes a comment, that really knocks me. Um, depending on where I'm at in terms of mentally myself. So if there's something else in my life going on, I find that I'm a lot more vulnerable in those uh, situations. And every time that I am going into a new a new place, a new room full of people, in particular men, um, I get really anxious. And it's something that I just, I've just i learned to live with. And I've got little mechanisms that, that help me put myself in those rooms. Um, now the industry that I work in, I, I now work in this space campaign and with my company on 
um, social media abuse in particular, that's really hard. I, I need to take a deep breath every time I walk into a new surroundings and just think it's going to be OK. You'll survive it and you've survived everything up until now. Um, I've had every single comment in public made to me from the most horrific words to just disgusting statements about what people would want to do to me and that's tough and then social media I think I'll just live and get in day-to-day -day abuse and that's something that I've had to learn to deal with and I'm now probably numb to it mm. but there's still moments where I find myself it was only a, a few months ago I had someone um, actually send all my videos to every teammate at Jeez. Crystal Palace and that was hard. That was the toughest moment that I'd had in um, two years in this because I, that was just horrible to me. Um, I had a man just sending me constant abuse and because I was ignoring it, I wasn't reading it. He was telling my message requests. He was saying horrible words like, if you don't reply to me, bitch, I'm going to send this to all your friends and family. I'm going to ruin your life. He probably didn't realise that it had already been out there and that that damage mm. had already been done. But I went through it again and that's because they had sent it to we've got young girls in, um, at crystal palace people that know my story but don't know my story don't know the depths of it so for them to wake up in the morning with screenshots and a video in their inbox to me that not me that not me for the whole weekend i was in a really bad place and i really struggled with that but my bounce back ability is now much better um whereas those moments would have went on for weeks and months at a time they're now lasting hours to days at a time and they don't happen often so I would say I'm doing really, really well, but I don't think it, life will ever be perfect for me again or will never be the same for me because I'm always having to take that deep breath. I'm always having to take those moments and reflect about how far I've came or I've, I'm always having to prepare myself for the unknown, the unpredictable. What if someone does say something? You, you can see people talking to each other in certain rooms, like that's that girl. But now by fighting back, the best thing that came from me fighting back and having my own say on my own story is that now the narrative has changed for the majority. It's now, oh my goodness, Leah, I read your story. I watched, I watched your video on on the news. Like I think it's amazing, rather than oh my god, Lee, like seeing your sex tape. Mm. Um, so it's really nice that now the narrative is spinning for the majority of of individuals that I will face. Yeah, it's, it's horrendous that whole story. Uh, we might stick with Katrina and uh, in, Ian in studio here. I know Lee, you have to, you have to go, but listen, uh, thanks so many for hopping on with us and telling your story and, and keep doing what you're doing. I'm sure that word you use, bounce back ability. I'm sure you're an inspiration to your teammates and to your family and friends and everyone around you because of the way in which you've handled this. So thanks so many for hopping on and, and telling us your story. Yeah, absolutely. No, thank you so much, guys, and please keep doing what you're doing. I, I really appreciate it, and those that go through this as well really do so thank you so much it's really encouraging to know there's people that that really care and are doing amazing work behind the scenes on behalf of us all brilliant stuff lee nickel there thanks a million for, for joining us former professional footballer uh, and we still have katrina bentley ceo of men's aid ireland and on gordish akona detective superintendent ian lackey in studio with us as well uh, i mean katrina her, lee's story is obviously harrowing and and yeah. thankfully not too common, but more common maybe than people realise. Absolutely. And I think the, the key piece that I was taking from that is the underreporting for both men and women. Yeah. Um, and by having this conversation, hopefully it gives confidence and encourages anyone who's experiencing this to come forward. That will be, was the first um, note that I was, uh, I was just taking there. The other piece as well is, um, you know, the self-care that she mentioned there and the triggers. Um, and she mentioned that it was in her toolbox for herself um, and how difficult it is even a few years later still to be in the company of walking into a room of, because there's men in the room. So again, just the impact years later for, for, for her and her and her life um, and, and, and how strong she is in terms of, of, of challenging that and, and, and living through it. Um, and I suppose I was sitting here just thinking, well, what could we all take from this as well? Um, and is there, what's the call to action? You know, after this conversation, when 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 people um, are listening in, um, and as, and for me, it was you know, is there a possibility for um, because we know it's so widespread in Ireland as well? Is this an opportunity for sports clubs now to start adopting yeah. um, adequate internal responses um, or frameworks? So I suppose in terms of prevention. Um, and 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 detecting it and reporting it and sanctions within um, the sports uh, com communities etc. So for the leaders of the of various sports clubs around Ireland to actually maybe at the next board meeting or etc. to actually say well should, what can we do is there something we can do for mm -hmm. the boys and girls that are in our clubhouse etc. 
is what, what what's the onus on us and what can we to do so to support somebody if it did happen to us because it's happened to Leah here's here's an, an excellent example it's a horrific example mm. but let's take the learnings and what can support our clubs across Ireland and the UK indeed mm. what can they do now as, as a call to action yeah the education side yeah. of it like because I'm, I'm low to even mention the name but the likes of Andrew Tate and the impact that someone like that has on young men, including young men in Ireland and boys in Ireland, um, and and just the toxic masculinity that leads into all of this as well. It feeds into it, yeah. It feeds into a lot of stigma as well, and and, and such a, a wide area. But um, I think there is an onus um, for that to protect any of the the mm. young, 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 young sports uh, boys and girls, and 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 they're growing up through the the ranks. That for them to know from from the top down that this behaviour will not be acceptable. Again, it's the prevention side of it, um, and that there would be sanctions if if, if it was to, to if it was to, is, if it is to occur. And and before we finish as well, Ian, I know there there on God Shikona publishes warning signs as well on this. Like there can be number of of, of warning signs as well. You know, people realise that some things don't add up, and and there are ways in which to maybe spot that something could be potentially happening to you. Yeah, well, I suppose if, if you, like you're befriended kind of and, and that befriending becomes nearly overwhelming, you know, and people yeah. want you to do this and they're forcing you nearly to to maybe share an image. But like if you share an image, you lose control of that image, you know, mm. and I mean, this is no different to maybe you have a hundred photographs of yourself in, in a compromising position and you throw them out the window of a bus. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's it's like that. It just, it, it can go horribly wrong and it has gone horribly wrong uh, for so many people. Um, just in relation to what I was saying earlier and, and with, if there is any demand for money, like do not pay, but do not panic either, that mm. the help and support is there either through hotline.ie, but if you want us to be involved, absolutely, we will become involved. Um, it's a little bit more difficult if it's a financial element because it's probably an organised crime probably that aren't based here in Ireland mm. however if it's more of a a former partner thing obviously that's far easier for us from an investigative point of view you know and that's yes. where most of the prosecutions have come so for people as I said at the start the panel is with the Department of Justice sharing intimate, Im intimate images without consent is a crime visit hotline.ie which we've mentioned to report quickly easily and anonymously uh, or basically contact and Scotty Connor. that's what please, we're saying yeah, here yeah please Guys, you'll be dealt with in confidence, absolutely. Like. Absolutely, 100%. It, it's definitely an important conversation. I'm glad we're probably only touching the tip of the iceberg here this afternoon. But uh, thanks to you both for coming in. And, thanks of course, thanks to Lee Nickel as well for uh, for sharing her story with us. Uh, Lee Nickel, the former professional footballer, most recently with Crystal Palace, with the Angarda Shikona Detective Superintendent Ian Lackey and Katrina Bentley, the CEO of Men's Aid Ireland. Thanks a lot for coming in. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a million.